My name is Ben Brode. Uh, I got a clicker. Okay, here we go. Let me make sure my clicker works. There we go. Okay, uh, I'm the chief development officer at Second Dinner, uh, where uh, over the last five years we made Marvel Snap. Before that, I spent the last uh, 15 years at Blizzard, uh, doing QA and other things for Warcraft 3, World of Warcraft, Diablo 2, and some other stuff. Uh, but I spent most of my time there on Hearthstone, where I was the uh, first game designer and eventually the game director on that game. I also have a successful rap career on YouTube, um, <laughs> but I'm mostly known for having a weird laugh. This is holding up better than I thought. I'm so far so good. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. So uh, this talk is about how we designed Marvel Snap. It took us a little over four years, uh, and over the next hour, I'm going to talk about everything we tried, the stuff that worked, the stuff that didn't work, um, and everything I learned from that process, mostly about the uh, core gameplay of Marvel Snap. And uh, I was going to show you an outline, but instead I'm just going to show you every slide in the presentation. That's it. That's the whole presentation. <laughs> and as you can see, there's no cute cat images, so keep your expectations low, please. <clears throat> Marvel Snap is a uh, mobile-first, super-fast digital collectible card game where Players compete to win two out of three locations by playing cards to locations and trying to add up all their power from their cards to get the highest total power on their side. Uh, we did some crazy stuff like make all of our cards in, in 3D. Uh, but one of the biggest things that we did is add this cool uh, betting and bluffing mechanic uh, with the cube where you could snap on it to, to double the stakes of the game. Uh, how many of y'all have tried Marvel Snap? Uh, wow, okay, I'll buy you a copy, sir. <laughs> Okay, so step one, inspiration. Uh, designers are like chefs. For the most part, we don't invent new ingredients. We <clears throat> take ingredients that always, already exist and combine them in new and exciting ways. For example, you might give two different chefs flour, water, tomato, tomato basil, and cheese, and one of them might make pizza. And the other one might make pasta. But the pasta chef wouldn't go to the pizza chef and say, Ray, I invented flour. Right, that's my thing. You took flour from me. Uh, it's not about inventing new ingredients. It's about how we mix them. And sometimes people find really exciting ways to mix old ingredients, like this fellow online I found who has a recipe for basil tomato cheesecake. <laughs> so as fans of games, uh, we gather ingredients naturally as we play games. But I wanted to talk about how I approach ingredient gathering differently as I start a new project. So I'm going to talk about how we did this for Marvel Snap, but one of the things we tried on Snap, uh, some of the things we tried on Snap were, I, were either the result of uh, lessons I learned on my time on Hearthstone that worked really well for us, or uh, the result of some hard lessons I learned while on Hearthstone that I want to do it a little differently for Snap. So I'm going to tell a few Hearthstone stories along the way here, starting with my first visit to the supermarket 15 years ago. So... Uh, 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 15 years ago is when we started working on Hearthstone, and this is before the App Store existed, before the iPad was announced. In 2008, when people talked about mobile games, they were talking about Game Boy games. Uh, so the first thing I did when I joined the Hearthstone team was play literally every game in the digital collectible card game genre. And I, I learned a ton from playing these games. Sometimes I found a new ingredient I was excited to try. Sometimes I just found out I didn't like onions or something. Uh, but that's still really valuable. For example, I didn't know that I wouldn't uh, enjoy a grid-based card combat system in the collectible card game until I played all these games. And it's way cheaper to learn that lesson by playing someone else's games than to prototype it yourself and learn it that way. Uh, but despite there having been a fair number of digital collectible card games in 2008, most of the inspirations for Hearthstone came from physical games. So here's the recipe for Hearthstone's core gameplay. Uh, we took a lot of ingredients from the World of Warcraft trading card game, like the card types, uh, direct attacking, sticky damage, the win condition. A really important ingredient from Battle Spirits, uh, which is uh, being re-released soon, which is the mana system. And then we came up with a few important innovations like hero powers, no responses, weapon durability, the fatigue mechanic, and general low complexity. So I asked uh, Mike Elliott, who was the designer on Battle Spirits, uh, how he comes up with new ideas for games. Because he's designed like hundreds of board and card games. Uh, and I have not designed hundreds of games. So I was like, how do you do it? How do you go? And he told me he gets all of his game ideas from games conventions. He just walks the show floor where everyone's showing off 
all their new stuff that they've been working on. And he just lets ideas come to him. He just soaks them up. And then when he leaves the convention, he's got like 12 new ideas for games. This is a supermarket. It's full of ingredients. Uh, so this is a picture of Gen Con, where I, I went uh, in 2008 or 9, and this is where I discovered Battle Spirits, which ended up becoming a big inspiration for Hearthstone. Uh, so I used Mike's technique to find and become inspired by his game, which I thought was kind of cool. So I worked on Hearthstone for about six years before it shipped, but I missed the uh, launch party for Hearthstone, because my son was born that day. And uh, I, the, we hadn't launched on mobile yet, but I, I got uh, a special build of the game on my phone, uh, and I spent a lot of time playing Hearthstone on my phone while I was holding my son on the other hand. And uh, being a dad really changed the way that I could play games. I couldn't just sit in front of my computer for four hours raiding. I had to get my games in while at the park or while in the bathroom. So uh, Clash Royale came out a couple years later, and I was super jealous of Clash Royale because you, if you have five minutes, you, you are 100% sure you can get a game of Clash Royale in. Um, and I thought that was just brilliant. And then uh, five years ago, uh, Hamilton and I, Hamilton the EP, was the EP on Hearthstone, he's the CEO of Second Dinner, uh, set out to build, build a new company, try something new. And we didn't know that we were going to make a uh, collectible card game. But once we decided to do that, I once again found myself playing every mobile digital collectible card game I could find. Uh, so here's all the games I was playing in 2018. And that game on the left, Card Monsters 3 Minute Duels, uh, is really cool. It's a, uh, has anyone played that game? Yeah. Oh my gosh, what up? We probably fought on the ladder. Uh, so I, uh, it's great. It's, it's a vertical, mobile, digital, collectible card game. And uh, in, in some ways, it was the proof I was looking for that there was something really cool in the space. So what was the recipe? Wow, my voice is better when I talk deep. What was the recipe for Marvel Snap? What ingredients did we gather? This is the mystery I'm setting up to pull you all through the rest of my presentation here. <clears throat> So we had a bunch of ingredients running around in our heads, and it was time to prototype. So this is what the first prototype for Marvel Snap looked like. <laughs> I'm serious. OK, so we were sitting around brainstorming game ideas, and Hamilton said, you know, I've always wanted to play a turn-based strategy game with the backgammon doubling cube. And so I booted up Hearthstone, and every turn of the game, Hamilton said, you know, would you double the cube right now? If, you're, if your opponent doubled the cube, would you concede? And uh, we got to immediately feel the impact of that mechanic without having to build anything. And through those initial playtests, we realized a couple things about, about this doubling mechanic. It increased the emotional range, right? Instead of just one star per match, you're playing for potentially a lot more stars. We spent less time losing, right? In a, in a normal game, if you have like a 5% chance to win, you gotta play that all the way out, right? Because you might win. And that, that period of time where you're like probably going to lose can be pretty grueling, like the final six hours of a game of Monopoly. <laughs> uh, but when, when you're incentivized to bail out because you're gonna lose less cubes, you can just, you can just leave and, and uh, you spend less time in that grueling zone. Uh, games that you don't play all the way to completion are faster, obviously. Uh, but there was two other things that I think had a really big impact that I'm going to dig into a little bit more. So the first is zero sum is zero fun. If two players play a game and one of them wins and the other loses, and it is as fun to win as it is not fun to lose, you have created net zero joy. You just, you just moved happiness from one person to another. So uh, we were, we were uh, trying to avoid this situation. There's a bunch of ways to tackle this. The, uh, the first is bots. It's one of the easiest ways to avoid zero sum because you just have a player who's winning and nobody's losing. So I, I, I really like PUBG Mobile. I played a lot of PUBG Mobile. And the first time I played it, I got first place. And the second time I played it, I got first place. Again, out of 100 people. And I started thinking, you know, I used to play Eliminate on iOS, and I played Metroid Prime Hunters on Nintendo DS. Maybe these skills are coming back to me after all these years. And so I posted this screenshot on Facebook. And I was like, guys, I just won my first two games of PUBG Mobile. I'm so good, which is you know, a little annoying. And all my uh, friends jumped on in the comments. like, dude, you played 100% bots in those first two games. And I was you know, embarrassed, so I deleted the post. But, uh, <laughs> But if they hadn't told me, I would have experienced all of the joy of victory without any of the agony of defeat. So instead, I just have to bask in the joy of having a rad-looking character avatar. Uh, 
So at GDC 2014, my uh, mentor and the original game director of Hearthstone, Eric Dodds, gave a talk about Hearthstone design values. He talked about little victories. The big victory is whether you win or lose the game. And the little victories are things that happen during the game, anything that makes you feel smart or powerful. So imagine playing a game of Counter-Strike and you come out of the spawn point and someone headshots you and you die. You had no moment where you felt smart or powerful during that game. But let's imagine you're playing a game of Counter-Strike and you run out and you're just blowing up everyone on the enemy team and eventually you lose, but you still felt like awesome while you were doing it. That's little victories. So essentially little victories add a little joy even if you lose. So on Hearthstone, we avoided cards that blow up enemy mana crystals or force your opponent to discard cards because they, they could potentially create scenarios where you never get to feel powerful. And in Marvel Snap, there's six turns. You always get to play six turns. You always get to do something. You get to play some of your cards and feel a little bit powerful while you do it. Uh, but the cube had one of the biggest impacts on the zero-sum paradigm. So we found that when your opponent snaps and you retreat, it could feel like this. In some cases, it made losing feel like victory. It's a strategic retreat where you don't fall victim to your opponent's gambit. And we, we realized we could emphasize this with some presentation changes. So this is what the concede button used to look like. Here's what it looks like now. Here's what it used to look like when you retreated, and, and here's what it looks like now. You didn't lose, you escaped. You're a genius. <laughs> so this, this presentation stuff works in reverse as well. When you uh, lost a game, we used to have the announcer go, you lose, and we cut that because it's, it's emphasizing exactly the emotions we're trying to minimize. So the effects on the zero-sum problem were encouraging, but the really game-changing uh, effects of, of the cube was the depth. Please excuse me for one second. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we often talk about poker as a game that has never required an expansion to remain strategically deep for decades. And it's because of the power of betting and bluffing mechanics. Uh, so uh, Hearthstone with a doubling cube is all of the depth of Hearthstone plus all of the depth of these betting and bluffing mechanics. And we, we thought, hey, what if we could reduce the complexity of the genre and lean on the cube mechanic to make up for some of the depth that we lose by simplifying the genre? So with that insight, we set out to build the simplest card game we could that would allow for us to use a doubling cube. So I, I love games that are simple and have a lot of depth. Uh, a lot of people use these words, complexity and depth, differently. So here's how I'm gonna define them today. Complexity is the cost you pay before you can play the game. It's the learning you have to do. Depth is the fun part. It's the interesting decisions. So uh, here's a review we got on Metacritic when we launched Hearthstone. And uh, this was a common criticism at the time when we first came out with the game. And I think it's because a lot of people misunderstand the relationship between complexity and depth. A lot of players want deep games. And it's true that you have to add complexity to add depth. So people see games with lots of complexity and they assume it's got the depth that they're looking for in a game. But you can add complexity that doesn't add any depth. For example, if we had a rule that says, uh, every time you play a card in Marvel Snap, you have to yell the name of your card into the microphone or you lose, that's an important rule. You have to learn that rule, but it doesn't add any interesting depth to the game. On the other end, uh, there's complexity that yields an outsized amount of depth. We often call mechanics that yield a lot of depth for a small amount of complexity uh, elegant designs. For example, tic-tac-toe is a game that has very little complexity and also very low depth. Go has a little bit more complexity, has a humongous amount more depth. Monopoly has uh, a, a, only a little bit uh, uh, more depth than tic-tac-toe, in my opinion, uh, but a lot more depth. Uh, this top right box, I chose Magic the Gathering because it has a huge amount of depth, uh, but also AI researchers called it the world's most complex game. <laughs> so you can mitigate you know, adding more depth by slowly introducing new concepts over time, right? And if, if you get more depth by adding complexity, shouldn't you just keep adding more complexity to get more of that depth? I actually think there's a depth limit. If your game already takes a lifetime to master, what does adding more depth get you? More lifetimes, you only get one. So I think the goal is, how do you reach the depth limit with the smallest amount of complexity? So if your game has this much depth, uh, perhaps you should remove complexity and depth until you get there. I hope the, the little star is visible there. Uh, however, removing complexity can have a weird effect on your team. 
So uh, in early Hearthstone, Taunt was, a, uh, was supposed to be a one-time effect. If, you're, if you attacked an enemy minion with Taunt, it would lose Taunt. And there was a bug one day where that stopped working, and it just kept Taunt forever. And we thought about it, and we said, you know, this is, this is simpler if they just keep Taunt forever. They just, they just always have Taunt. So let's just not fix the bug. And uh, a lot of members on the team came up to us and said, hey, the game just got a lot less deep. There's like all this really interesting combat decisions where you're trying to like, you know, drop Taunt in, this, in their correct order. And uh, they were, they're not wrong. The, the, it's, it's less deep. But the thing is, the team had already paid all of the complexity cost to learn how this works. So when you remove complexity, they only feel the resulting loss of depth. So I've been talking a lot about rules complexity, but you know what matters even more than rules complexity? Text complexity. This is the filter through which people will learn the rules of your game. And it, you can make the game seem much simpler or much more complicated, depending on how you explain it. And we've all felt this when we sit down to play a board game with our friends, and they just, you're just baffled at the end of the explanation. You're like, just, let's just play one turn. Uh, so uh, this talk by George Fan at uh, uh, the 2012, entitled How I Got My Mom to Play Through Plants vs. Zombies, is the best GDC talk of all time. It's fantastic, yeah. Uh, and this slide was mind-blowing to me. If you put more than eight words on the screen, players will not read them. Uh, I think he's right. And so here is every tooltip in the first 15 minutes of Marvel Snap. And here are the word counts for each tooltip. And uh, I'm very excited about this. There's some flavor dialogue that comes up that is there's more than eight words uh, every once in a while. Uh, but I don't care if you don't read that stuff because it's just flavor. This is the important stuff that you need to learn. Uh, the thing that's really hard to do is card text. So we realized that on Hearthstone, for a digital game, we didn't need to write out as much of the edge case stuff. So your hero deals two fire damage, two target hero or ally became deal two damage. Uh, the average word count for Hearthstone was nine words. And for Snap, it's 11, partially because we don't use keywords. Uh, so we've fallen short of the George Fan ideal there, which makes me sad. Uh, but to make sure the text complexity stayed low, we would audition our cards with people. We would sit them down and show them the cards. And if, uh, if you had to read a card more than one time, we said, raise your hand and let us know, because we don't want any card text to be confusing enough that you'd have to read it twice to understand it. So this was our goal. Low complexity, high depth, and the doubling cube really helped us get there. It's easy to understand, it adds a ton of depth. However, the simple mechanic of the doubling cube ended up taking a ton of iterations to get just right. So it, when we played it physically uh, with just paper and a, and a die, we had no limit. You could just double the cube as many times as you want to. We knew we needed to have a little more structure when we moved into a digital prototype. So we said, okay, you can double once a turn and we'll just throw up a dialogue box that says, hey, your opponent wants to double the cube. Are you, are you cool sticking around or do you want to concede right now? <clears throat> And it was pretty jarring, because it interrupted, you just like, have to stop playing your cards in the middle of your turn to process the dialogue box. So I said, okay, uh, what if we move it to the end of the turn? Right? You do all your actions, and then we'll tell you what your opponent wanted to do, and we'll compare to what you wanted to do, and we'll resolve it then. And that helped. We started to experiment with some stuff, like, could we make the, the betting and bluffing even more, have even more texture? So we added not just the ability to double the cube, but would you also like to mega double the cube? Which was, we didn't like the word octuple. It sounds kind of nerdy, so we went with mega double. And uh, this was pretty cool, because you could like, get them to limp in with a double, or like, you know, slam a huge uh, bet with an 8x there. But there was a lot of dialogue boxes. And a bunch of the people on the team like, didn't even understand, wh like, what are these numbers? Why do I care about all this? Like, I just want to play the card game, and you're getting in the way of all these dialogue boxes. So we had what I think was the biggest inspiration in this whole journey, which is, uh, what if we moved the double acceptance from an explicit like, yes, I accept the double, to an implicit acceptance of the double. So we, uh, we just had the cube automatically double every turn, and we said, hey, next turn, the cube's going to increase in value. Do you want to stick around? And if you do, we're just going to assume you've accepted the double. And this was, it's, we used the term arcade after we made this change. It feels so much faster. We got rid of all the dialogue boxes. We loved it. But players missed the ability to hit a button to really project their confidence to their opponent. So uh, we added the ability to tap on the cube to take it from doubling next turn to going to mega doubling to going up to 8x next turn. 
And this caused another problem, uh, which was if you're playing most of your games for hundreds of cubes, but on turn one, you're only playing for one cube and your hand is just slightly less than average, you should bail out, right? Just like only play the games where you have a chance to win hundreds of cubes by having a great hand. So people were conceding on turn one most of the games. We realized we had to bring in the range so that the average cube game and the starting cube game were much closer in, in uh, scale. So we got rid of all the auto doubling and just let people snap a couple times. Hopefully that would bring it down. People missed the, having the opportunity to bail out before the game ended. They really liked feeling like an excuse to leave. So we combined all of our <laughs> approaches up to now. We had one auto double at the end of the game, so you could bail out on turn five if you want to. We had one snap where you could tap on the cube to double it. Eventually we added the snap back, and that's where we ended up. That's how we got there. It was quite, it was quite the journey. But why did we call tapping on the cube a snap? Uh, and for that matter, why is the game called Marvel Snap? It's because naming is impossible. <laughs> This is one of our many brainstorms where we tried to name the game, uh, featuring such hits as Marvel Cosmic Posse, Marvel All Caps Orb. Um, we we uh, briefly considered calling the game Infinity Stone Heroes of Marvel, but we didn't do that. Uh, so normally I use a naming hack to name things. So this is a uh, uh, frame from an XKCD comic uh, where he talks about two syllable words where the emphasis is on the first syllable and how much fun these words are to say. Does anybody know what this poetic term is called? No, no, close. That, that, you got it. It's, it's, I don't know how to pronounce it. I, I ask because I don't know how to pronounce it. So I'm just gonna, <laughs> I think it's trochee is what I think it is. Uh, and uh, they're just fantastic. Trochees are like the best word type. Uh, does anybody know the name of any famous companies? Just yell them out. Famous companies. Well, not all at once. I can't hear you. <laughs> I did kind of ask for that. Okay, I'll just show you their answer here. So <laughs> these are all trochees. Riot, Blizzard, Google, Facebook, Marvel, Netflix, Lego, Tesla, Meta, Intel, Apple, Call of Duty, YouTube. Every word up here is a trochee. Uh, and I also believe that what you name your game or company or whatever doesn't matter at all. So what's the first thing you think of when I showed you this word? Was it, was it the, 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 one of those, right? Some of you, some of you is one, some of the others. Uh, this one probably most of y'all thought about the one on the left here. And I don't know about, about y'all, but I never imagined deer constellations or space dollars when I saw this word. You can, you can literally name stuff whatever you want, and people will fill that name in with new meaning, whatever you tell them it is. In fact, your game's name doesn't even need any real words in it. These are all nonsense words. And nobody's like, I'm sorry, you say this game is called chess? What's a chess? <laughs> so why Marvel Snap? Well, for years, we struggled with the narrative wrapper for the game. Hearthstone has an evocative and grounded wrapper. It's the game that denizens of Azeroth play in a tavern. It's not so much a story, but a setting and a vibe. So what is Snap's setting? Does it have a story? And how do we tell it? Well, this is the thing I hate more than anything in video games. Welcome to Marvel Snap. The evil villain Thanos has assembled the all power Infinity Stones. Here are some. I hate this so much. Uh, and to demonstrate the point, I've created the story tier list for you. So at S tier, we've got a story for the ages. At F tier, we've got a boring story. And here's the thing at A tier, no story at all. It's just not that much worse than having a story for the ages. So if you are choosing between having a boring story or just cutting all the story out, cut the story out, please. And I, I consider vibes and setting to be really different than story. Some people say, when, they, when I say story, they, they hear plot, and I think that's accurate. I don't have to understand Street Fighter's story to, to be able to enjoy it. And the game doesn't even try and explain it to me. They just say, Blanca versus E Honda, fight. And nobody asks, well, hold on, why, why are they fighting? <laughs> so this is how I wanted to think about Marvel Snap. Uh, but, but despite that, we tried to ham fist the story in anyway. So here's an actual presentation I gave the team here. The Infinity Stones have been destroyed. Their shards spread throughout the galaxy. Forces have moved to collect them. They cannot fall into the wrong hands. The stones must be reformed, but he can never know. Marvel snap. So, 
Uh, the plan was not to actually tell that story in that way in the game, but uh, to use it as the setting for why you'd want to get cubes, and we called them infinity stones at that time, and what your goal is in the game. So players would collect infinity shards, and as they got more and more of them, they'd assemble infinity stones, which would unlock new features in the game. And we ended up pivoting away from these gameplay mechanics and the theming associated with them, as you'll see here. Uh, uh, but we loved the name so much that we decided to keep it. And to tie the name back in, we named our most iconic gameplay mechanic after the name. Oh, snap. So uh, thank you. Uh, naming it a snap was a last ditch effort to make our name make any kind of sense now that we've stripped all the Infinity Stone stuff out of it. So why keep the name without the Infinity Stone theming? We could have changed the name to Marvel Cube or something. Well, we love the energy behind it. We love the, the snappiness of it. And uh, uh, you know, games are over in a snap. It's a snap to learn. At the end of the day, I think the approachability and impact, uh, inherent fun of the name makes an impact. Okay, so let's, let's check in on our recipe, see how we're doing here. We've got the doubling cube from Backgammon and uh, five minute mobile friendly experience from Clash Royale. Uh, but the rest of the inspirations, once again, once again, came from physical board and card games. Ah, pause for impact, okay. So this is my dad, and when I was a kid, he used to give me his old business cards, and I would design card games on the back. So I got my first job at Blizzard. I kept all my old business cards, <laughs> imagining that someday I would get to use them to make card games with. Uh, and this is the first physical prototype that we made on the development process for Marvel Snap on the back of my first business cards. So we had the doubling cube. We tried to keep it simple with only two numbers per card. We had some kind of weird leveling system. But the big thing that we were trying to achieve uh, was simultaneous reveals. So this is my favorite two-player board game, Lord of the Rings, The Confrontation by Reiner Kinesia, who's the most prolific board game designer ever to live. He's got many hundreds of games to his credit. Uh, it's like Stratego, but when you fight an opponent's unit, you both play a card face down and you reveal your cards at the same time and it impacts the battle. I love the mind games in this game. It's incredible. I also love this game, the Game of Thrones board game by Christian Peterson. It also has that same mechanic. When two armies fight, you play a card face down, you reveal them at the same time. Super fun. I found myself really drawn to this particular ingredient and I wanted to experiment with it in card games. So I know this prototype had simultaneous reveals, but otherwise, I cannot remember for the life of me how to play it, because we only played it one time. And after we were done, me and Hamilton looked at each other and we said, yo, this game sucks. Which was very de demoralizing. Uh, when, when you're playing cards simultaneously, you need some kind of context. What do I think they're gonna play? And then you could play around those suspicions. So we need something to start on the board to give you that context. And I should have known that we needed context because I used to participate in professional rock, paper, scissors competitions under a freeway overpass in Los Angeles. So uh, rock, paper, scissors is totally random, right? It's pretty boring. There's very little strategy in rock, paper, scissors. The thing is, in these tournaments, you get one minute of taunting before the match begins. So most people come in character like the barber or Sergeant Scissors. But sometimes people just use the whole minute and go, Paper, 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 paper. And hilariously, that adds some context, right? Are they telling the truth? Or are they trying to double bluff me? So this game, Smash Up by Paul Peterson, doesn't have simultaneous reveals, but you can play your cards to locations, and the locations have special abilities that make each game a little different. And I thought this could be a really cool way to give the game we were working on some context for simultaneous reveals. And they did. So Mojo World, for example, is a location that gives you plus 100 power if you have more cards than your opponent. Okay, I bet they're gonna play their cards to Mojo World. Or maybe I'll let them overcommit there and I'll try and take the other two locations. And this core decision making was simple, but immediately fun. In our earliest prototypes, all the locations started revealed, but we felt like that was a lot of information to absorb right at the beginning of the game. So we made them uh, reveal uh, on turn one, turn two, and turn three instead. So they gave us the context we needed, but I think more importantly, they increased the variance of our core gameplay. So I said George Fan has the best GDC talk, but this talk by Richard Garfield titled Luck in Games is my all time favorite design talk of any kind. So uh, I think most people misunderstand the relationship between luck and skill. A lot of people imagine it as a scale where you got luck on one side 
and skill on the other, and games are somewhere along this scale. And we use the terms luck-based and skill-based to talk about where games land on this scale. But that's not how it works at all. So you can have games that are low skill and high luck, like shoots and ladders, or high skill and low luck, like chess. But you can also have games, like my, my favorite game to make fun of, Tic-Tac-Toe, which is low skill and low luck. And you can have games that are high luck and high skill, like poker. Uh, like, there's a ton of randomness in poker, but the, you know, the best players are winning again and again. Games in the high luck, high skill category, I think are super fun, because they include a ton of interesting decisions, but they also have exciting moments and are different every time you play them. So all card games have some amount of randomness, because you shuffle a deck of cards and draw from a random deck. But Hearthstone, I think, has, has less variance at its core than other card games for a couple reasons. One, the mana system isn't random. You just get one every single turn of the game. Uh, smaller decks decrease the variance some amount. And because you aren't drawing resources, you're just drawing more usable cards every turn, so you effectively have a higher rate of card draw. And those all reduce the variance of Hearthstone's core gameplay rules. But the thing is, we wanted Hearthstone to have more variance. Uh, so we added a bunch of variance to the cards. So Arcade Missiles deals damage randomly, or Lightning Storm deals a range of damage, Animal Companion summons a random beast. And this was successful at making Hearthstone more random, but players didn't, didn't love it. Right? We got a lot of feedback that Hearthstone felt too random. I think part of it is that the randomness here is very overt, right? We had to put the word random on a lot of cards. Uh, but also, there's, there's two different kinds of randomness. So input randomness is where there's a random event, and then, like drawing a card, and then you, get to, you have to make a strategic decision in the face of that random event. For example, the hub, it's a random card in each player's hand, and then you and your opponent have to figure out how to use the, that card to your best advantage after you've seen the random event. So input randomness is awesome. It puts you in new situations you've never been in before. You have to think on your feet and solve problems on the fly. In games without a lot of input randomness, there's like a right answer, right? Like in chess, players have to, uh, if for you know, the really high levels, it's not like, okay, what piece do I move on turn one? You've got like an opening move. People memorize a series of opening moves until you get to the fun part of chess later on. Uh, because the random event happens and then you get to respond to it, you feel like you have a lot of control over the randomness in the game. And output randomness is the opposite. So output randomness is where you make a decision and then you find out if it was the right decision or the wrong decision. For example, Danger Room, uh, you have a 25% chance every time you play a card there for it to be destroyed. You have to decide to play a card there and then you're going to find out if it's the right decision or the wrong decision. Uh, Ragnaros just it deals eight damage to a random enemy. Maybe it's the enemy hero and you win. Maybe it's you know, the exact minion you didn't want to hit and you lose. But you have to choose to play Ragnaros first. So output randomness is exciting. It's uh, what like, streamers, like the viewers on, on Twitch love to see. It's, it's great stories. Uh, this is, I think, the most uh, uh, ex exciting, the like, best question we can ask players in games, which is, is it worth the risk? And as a player deciding, okay, I, I think I'm going to lose this game. I need to start taking some risks. I'm going to start playing cards at Danger Room and hope I you know, don't, don't get that 25%. I think that's really interesting depth, and that's the kind of depth you get from output randomness. Uh, having the ability, seeing that a random event's coming and controlling the odds, for example, destroying all the other minions, Ragnaros is definitely going to hit the ones you want, is also some fun depth that comes from output randomness. And this is interesting. If you have output randomness, players will say that they lost to the randomness, which has pros and cons. Uh, the cons are that it feels like you don't have very much agency and you just kind of lost randomly and your skill doesn't matter. But the pro is that uh, as people, we are unable to grapple with our own ineptitude. And uh, this provides an outlet for your ego. So locations, I think interestingly, are both input randomness and output randomness. And you get to choose which of those you want more of. So if you play to a revealed location, that's input randomness. You got to see what the location was going to be, and then you decide to play a card there or not. And if you play to an unrevealed location, that's output randomness, right? You play a card to, a to an unrevealed location, and then surprise, it's murder world. Your cards are dead. <laughs> Mistake. Uh, so we've talked about a couple of the impacts of locations, the randomness, the ad, simultaneous reveals. Uh, uh, but they also have a couple other interesting effects. So in a, in a collectible card game, over time, the meta gets stale. And this is why people, other card games, release thousands of new cards a year, hundreds of new cards a year, to keep the, ma the meta fresh. It's because eventually you, you run uh, out of new problems to solve, right? I've seen this deck before. I know what it's trying to do. 
locations give you every single game something new, something exciting that's gonna happen, and so it reduces the effect of a stale meta some amount. And by the same token, it lowers the impact of imbalance, right? Everyone's playing the same deck as one deck is broken, and at least the locations are giving you new problems to solve, even if enemy players are not. Balance is still important, but it lowers the impact some, some amount. And then it makes live ops, I mean, it's still a lot of work to do for live ops, but it adds a cool lever for us, right? We can uh, add new locations or change the locations uh, to create live ops pretty easily. For example, uh, we have this thing called a hot location, where one day a week, this location shows up in 50% of all games. It causes players to change their decks and take advantage of the location. Uh, it adds some, some fun live ops flavor to the game. Uh, it, it, unless we make the hot location uh, make the current best deck even better, and then it uh, reduces the, it increases the staleness of the genre, like we did when Mr. Negative was the best deck, and we made the peak the featured location. Huge mistake. Uh, so we had 100 locations going in the launch, and late in the game we decided, hey, wait a second, what if we cut 60 locations, and instead launch with 40 locations, and then we could launch one new location every single week for a year? And uh, 40 was not the right number, but we did cut most of the locations and have been releasing one every week for a year, and it was a great way to kind of front load our launch with tons of live ops content. Okay, so we had the doubling queue, we had simultaneous the reveals, we had locations, we started having a ton of fun, and all in all, this prototype, uh, starting from that first prototype of this one, took about two days. Uh, which is not very normal, and we, didn't, we doubted ourselves a lot. We, started, we took a break from this and started trying to design some other games because we weren't sure this was it. But we just keep wanting to come back and play this one. We eventually printed out the prototype instead of writing it on some cards because we were fighting over the only copy of Galactus. Uh, and we used this prototype years later to prototype 2v2. So 2v2 is just five locations, and uh, your team has to win three out of five of the locations. Uh, it was really fun. We wouldn't have been able to do it easily without the physical prototype, I think, because it's hard to prototype digitally. Now, I'm not saying we're ever going to do 2v2. It's just something we were experimenting with, but uh, it, was fun to, it was fun to try. Okay, so here's the full recipe for Marvel Snap. We had the doubling queue for backgammon, simultaneous reveals and mind games from Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones, locations with abilities from Smash Up, uh, five-minute games from Clash Royale, and a, a few, I think, uh, really impactful innovations, six-turn games, 12-card decks, and I think for the first time, maybe, in a, in a collectible card game, only one card type, which means there's like no card types, right? It's not even a thing. Uh, so these innovations were impactful, but it's not clear to me that your game needs any innovations to feel fresh and exciting and unique. For example, I think if you asked players of Marvel Snap, what are the top three fresh things in Marvel Snap, I think none of the innovations would be on that list. So uh, with the basic core gameplay figured out, it was time to move to our digital prototype. And here's the first digital prototype. We were prioritizing moving fast, so I think it took about two weeks to make. Uh, I don't know how to do any networking stuff, so it was a hot seat prototype uh, where both people play on the same screen. We played a bunch on the iPad. This is a big iPad, but uh, it looks bigger. That's my son's four-year-old hand there, so <laughs> the scale's off. So we tried to make this stuff super easy to change so we could essentially figure out all of the, the right number for all of the levers in the game by brute, brute force. So we tried six turn games, five turn games. We tried skipping turn one, doing turns two through six. We tried three, four, five cards in the starting hand. We tried nine cards per location, six cards, three cards, four cards per location. We tried it all. So everything up to this point uh, was done while the studio was just, was just two people, me and Hamilton. Not, not that we had all that much stuff. We scribbled on some cards and spent a couple weeks on a prototype. Uh, but I think having the smallest team possible really allows for a dramatic pivot. Because uh, you spend less time explaining the vision and getting buy-in from, from a large team. So in my, my first year on Hearthstone, the team was about 10 people. And Blizzard came in to a meeting one day and said, hey, we're going to take all of the engineers and we're going to move them on to help ship StarCraft II. We're going to leave about three people left on the team. And we were pretty sure the game was canceled. We just thought, oh, that's, that's got to be it. There's, they're never coming back. Uh, the people left on the team uh, were uh, Ben Thompson, the art director, and Eric Dodds and I. And Eric Dodds was the, the first lead designer. <clears throat> at the time this happened, there was a ton of momentum in another direction. We were working really hard on basically some other project. And when this happened, it allowed us to be really flexible and experiment quickly and try crazy stuff. And the, the rest of the team wasn't totally gone. They were around for play tests and some conversations and stuff. But essentially, at the end of the year where those, those team members came back, we had the, 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 the totality of 
Hearthstone's core gameplay figured out and prototyped. Once a team gets really big, turning the ship becomes way harder. So late in the game on Marvel Snap, we had a really big pivot where we changed all of the, the theming and, and got rid of some currencies. And the team up to this point had been giving feedback that they were worried that we hadn't really locked down some of our meta progression stuff just yet. There was a lot of change. And so I knew that this pitch to change stuff was not going to be, it was not going to go down easy necessarily. And so I met with everyone on the team individually to walk them through the pitch, give them the opportunity to ask questions, make sure that they felt heard. And it takes weeks to manage this kind of change management. And uh, uh, even the idea of having to do this adds a huge amount of friction to deciding to make a pivot. I think the worst thing you can do early on is not pivot when you should because you miss the opportunity to maybe do something great. So eventually we did end up adding some more folks and uh, here's our first two device build that our chief production officer, Young Wu, got working. Apparently he was a secret uh, back-end server engineer, which was a delightful surprise. Uh, and you can see we started with nine cards per location here. We were experimenting with, with five turns. We tried some wild stuff like a left versus right approach to locations to see if we can get that like face-off battle feeling going. Our art director, Jamaro Kindred, began to pretty up the game a bit. Uh, and we felt like we were cruising forward on our prototype, uh, but we ran into a snag. I think every other card game has had cards that say stuff like destroy target creature, things like that. We had a bunch of cards like that. And on Hearthstone, I think we had a great UI for this. You drag a card out, an arrow attaches to your cursor, and wherever you move your cursor, the arrows, so you know you're in targeting mode when you drag a card out that requires a target. And to cancel the battle cry, you tap on the card or just tap on any card in your hand. But on mobile, once you drag a card out, we have nothing to attach a cursor to. So you, we just, you just don't know that you're in targeting mode. People kept tapping back in their hand to play another card and canceling the battle cry. It, was, it didn't work very well. It was fundamentally broken on mobile. So we had to build a whole new UI. The screen darkens and desaturates to let you know you're in a new mode. The potential targets are lit up in color. They float above the board. And you could tap on the target you want. So this, I think this flow is just much worse than the, than the PC flow. But it's not like we could just remove targeting for the mobile version of Hearthstone. So when we started to run into these issues in Snap, we said, hey, what if we just get rid of targeting altogether? In reality, every Marvel Snap card requires a target. You have to target the left, middle, or right location. So essentially, we were asking players to choose two targets when, we, when cards required a target. And we realized that we could imply the second target from the first target. So here's Electra. She used to target any one-cost card. We changed her to target a random one-cost card at her location. The UI is much simpler. And usually, there's only one one-cost card at her location anyway. Uh, another way we remove targeting is by implying a target through card ordering. So here, Mystique used to be able to uh, choose a target to become a copy of. But in her next iteration, her target is implied by playing her after you play the card you want to copy. We didn't have that many cards that had required targets. It was like 10 or something. But, uh, but we changed them all, and the game felt much better. And with that solved, we continued to make progress in the game, and the prototype most morphed slowly into a real build. And eventually, it looked, I think it looks great. <laughs> OK, so earlier in the talk, I bragged about how it took us two days to design the core gameplay for Marvel Snap. But uh, as it turned out, we would be paid back for that good fortune with four years of struggle trying to come up with a core loop and uh, pr satisfying progression model for the game. So here's a, uh, here's a diagram of our core loop. Don't read this, please. Uh, this is one of the many iterations we were working through. Uh, it was madness. We had leagues where uh, you'd have to do better to get up to the next league, and that's where certain cards were league restricted. Uh, it, we had... Uh, uh, we built a hero collector that worked like World of Warcraft garrisons where you'd send heroes off on missions to bring back cards for you. Uh, this is a sphere grid with every card in the game on it, and you'd have to decide which cards you want to make progress towards. Uh, so the big lesson we learned from all that was we needed to simplify. Uh, so we went from this to this. We cut a ton of stuff, and we saw this, and we were like, yes, we did it. We got there. And we went into our next testing phase. And unfortunately, it was still wildly overcomplicated. We had these uh, leagues, but we pasted over the problems we were having with these bizarre theming changes with Infinity Stones. We had a buy-in. You got to choose the stakes of the game before you went in. We had this weekly rank. Um, here's, a, here's a shop where you could just buy the cards you wanted directly, and they rotated every day, which means uh, after not that long, the only cards remaining are the cards you definitely don't want to buy. This doesn't, didn't work at all. And so we went from, from this in 2020 uh, to this. 
And this is what we shipped with. And I, I always feel pretty dumb when I spend so much time like analyzing a design problem and I'm like, aha, the answer is to add more complexity only to realize that the answer was to simplify and remove complexity. Uh, but this quote from Pascal makes me feel better. I would have written a shorter letter, but I did not have the time. <laughs> so speaking of time, I'm almost out of it, but I wanted to wrap this up uh, by boiling it down to four takeaways. But before I do, I just wanted to say one last thing. The design of the core gameplay of Snap was, I think, foundationally important to the, to the whole experience, but it's only like 1% of the total amount of work to make the game great. What's much more important is all of the decisions we made as a team that add, add up over four years of game development. So we're basically a fully remote studio at this point, so I don't, I don't have a lot of great pictures of the whole team, but I, I wanted to say the team at Second Dinner is bonkers, and I'm super lucky to be a part of it. Okay, so here's my, here's my four takeaways. Chefs need ingredients, so stock your pantry. Be the speedboat until your direction is clear. Embrace randomness, input or output. And simplify, even if your team hates you. <laughs> all right, that's all I got. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, everybody. So I, I believe we have time for some questions. Uh, hello. Hello. Greetings. Oh, and if you're, you've got to fill out the, the thing to rate this. Evaluations. Evaluations. Thank you. I love the game. I've been played for a couple of months now. Finally got Thanos. Having a great time. I'm wondering about the, the, how much Disney has uh, an influence or collaborate on the creative aspects of the game. Not only recently you got to buff Wolverine a little bit, and is a key character, but also, I mean, I'm a big Marvel fan, and recently back in the Marvel United third season, and then I see a lot of the characters which I usually don't care about, that I'm suddenly care about because I know them from Marvel Snap. And then I wonder if this is a big part of the Disney overarching scheme. Great, uh, so I'll just repeat the question, just in case it's not gonna end up on the mic. The question is, how, like, what's the collaboration with Marvel like? How much are we a part of their strategy? Uh, and do we you know, collaborate on making characters powerful and stuff? So Marvel uh, is just unbelievably great to work with. They're just like wild good. So the, the team at Marvel Games, I, it, like we couldn't have made this game without their help. They basically let us do, like, do what we're really good at. And what they help us with is make sure the game is authentic and awesome. So we submitted an image of Gambit you know, throwing his cards. And they were like, hey, just so you know, like the cards don't pass through that ring. They come from, from there out or whatever. We're like, okay, we, we would, I wouldn't have known that personally, but they help make sure that you know, anybody who sees this game who's a big Marvel fan like says, oh yeah, that's exactly the right color for, you know, of that character or whatever. Uh, but they also, you know, they know we work in a multiverse. And so we're like, hey, can we do like band variants? Can we do like King the Conqueror, but like DJ King the Conqueror? And they were like, yeah, sounds good. But can you put him in outer space, that'll be even cooler. And we we're like, oh, rad. So uh, they, they're not uh, like pushing us in a direction. They're much more like collaborators. It really feels like we're on the same team trying to make a game together. So it's, it's been great. If you have the opportunity to work with Marvel, I highly recommend it. Yes. OK. Um, when is merch? <laughs> well, yeah, that's, a, that's on Marvel. Marvel controls all the merch. So I, I uh, yeah, tweet so, at Marvel, I guess. <laughs> so the real question would be, um, how much time was there between when you started brainstorming this to talking to Marvel, like having something to show them, and then actually getting contract? Uh, so uh, we, the guy who runs Marvel Games, Jay Ong, used to work with me and Hamilton a long ago. So we had a relationship that was existing, which is, which is partly how a brand new studio gets to work with Marvel. It's kind of ridiculous. Uh, but but uh, he knew that we had made great stuff in the past together, and he wanted to work with us again. So it, we, we had this, this suspicion that we might get to work with Marvel, but... Uh, it, was, it was probably set on the order of months before we showed them anything, and uh, uh, I don't know how long the contract took, but it, you know, we, you know, we were friends, so it kind of... Kind Thank of, you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh -oh. Sorry, you've got lines on the other oh. side. I just, oh, my oh, bad. Oh, uh, my goodness. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm here, too. Okay, hi. Uh, I was wondering, uh, variants that spawn other cards, like, don't show that variant. Like, if I play a baby Doctor Doom, I don't get baby Doom bots. Why? Yeah. 
Uh, it's a great question. Uh, sorry, <laughs> we don't. You don't get like uh, the cards that spawn other cards. The cards that they spawn are not very variants of the. Uh, it, it, yeah, I mean, it was something that we would like to do at some point. I think it would be great. We also want to do variants for cards that are spawned by locations, like rock variants. By the way, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, if you're watching this, please hit us up. We'd love, <laughs> we'd love to do a rock variant together. Uh, right. Thank you. We'd love to do it. Thanks. Okay, over there. So you discussed um, complexity versus depth and how a card that says just deal two damage still can have a lot of depth and hit the depth limit that you need. But eventually you've printed deal two damage. And you have to start like you know complexity creep oh, yeah. and so forth and so on. And I was wondering what your strategies are for you know six, ten years into the game, and yep. when all the simple cards are printed, there are no more simple cards left. What to do? Yeah. So the question is, yeah, you mine out the simple the simple rules, and then eventually you end up with only non non simple stuff. What do you do? I had a whole section of this talk called the primal fear of uh, working on a game with, with a, a small amount of design space. It's horrifying. So both on Hearthstone and on Marvel Snap, we, we I got a point where we're like, you know, we were looking at games like Magic the Gathering and around 30 years later, and they, those games are much more complicated. And so I, at least I imagine, I haven't been on those teams, but I imagine that, that they just don't have that same level of fear of like, what if we just run out of all the cards? At some point we will have designed all of the cards, right? And that's it, we pack up shop. But uh, what, what happened actually on Hearthstone was that there was a huge amount of design space, much, much, much more than I thought there was at, at the start. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's scary to trim back and end up with a very limited amount of design space, but uh, it's just never borne out in, in the scary way where there's nothing left to do. We always find more, more design space. It can get more and more challenging over time, but it's, it's never run into the spot where we haven't, we haven't ended up there. Now, over time, your audience will stop growing potentially, right? Like, you know, I, you know I, we all wish the audiences keep growing, but at some point, that maybe it's not as true. And at that point, the complexity wall at the start is not the thing that matters as much. Uh, it's the additional complexity you're adding. And so all, these, all the current players have already paid all the complexity cost. And so if you add a new mechanic or a new card type or a new zone or something, you just have to teach them that little bit of additional complexity. And so you can add design space over time to, to uh, give yourself more room to design more stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Um, most card games, or sorry, most mobile games, including Hearthstone, they're horizontal, right? At what point did you decide to use a vertical orientation? Uh, what design space did that open, or did you just do it so I could play while I'm driving or holding? Yeah, or right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, please don't play Marvel Snap while you're driving. Uh, uh, yeah, we, uh, so uh, the question is, when did it, and why did we decide to do vertical uh, orientation? I, I, I think we really wanted to make a mobile-first collectible card game. Right? Most other collectible card games that are on mobile feel like or are or are ports of uh, uh, PC card games, and we thought, uh, this is just, if we want this to be the best mobile collectible card game ever made, I think, it, I think we wanted to start vertical. So we just always started the whole game with that kind of as a design constraint, and uh, tried to make sure that every decision we made, we, even, we tried some weird stuff, like uh, we weren't sure if we could fit all the locations on the screen. So we had like a, a carousel of locations you could swipe back and forth between, and that did not, we didn't end up going that direction, but we were that committed to a vertical display. Thank you, appreciate it. So I have a question about like the uh, simplicity of your text on the card. So like how to fix the issue of my, uh, being some misunderstanding when the text is short? Because like sometimes I don't really understand the whole mechanics. In, so I need to like try, I have, uh, try so I can know the like real mechanism because like the other cars like putting their like extreme circumstance on the car, but you're not using this. So like yes. how you address this issue of like possible uh, misunderstanding. Yeah, so the question is about uh, what you do when there's a uh, clash between wanting short card text but being clear and yeah. making sure that people actually understand what you're saying. Uh, you know, it's interesting, there's a bunch of cards, uh, uh, I think it was called Shadow Madness in Hearthstone, which says take control of an enemy uh, minion like this turn only. And what it doesn't say is that it gives the minion charge, right? If you took control of an enemy minion, you wouldn't normally be able to attack with it. But the fact that it's only for this turn uh, it's obvious that you must be able to attack with it. And so we just kind of left that off the card. Uh, there's some stuff, there's some types of designs where you can just say, look, this is like a little bit, we don't explain everything, but like you, you, can, just, you can just try it. 
and uh, you'll learn after the first time. And ideally, the thing that you, uh, like the best scenario for you is the thing that actually happens. We often, when showing people cards and they ask a question, like, wait, I'm not sure about this edge case. We say, well, what do you think is going to happen? What's your suspicion? And we would write it, write it down. And if the suspicion is the correct thing, it might be worth it for us to have less text because they would like, I'm not sure, but I think it's gonna do this. That was good enough for us in a lot of cases. Um, but yeah, if, if, if the answer was they, they got the wrong thing or they couldn't guess, we would try and rewrite the card, even if it meant adding more text to it. So it's like follow the intui intuitive thought, sorry. Well, sorry, what was that? Like follow the intuitive thought. Like yes, right, you, you, you know, we try to make it intuitive, exactly. Thank you, sir. Thank you, appreciate it. Here. Um, thank you. I have so many questions, but um, I do want to ask about Fatui. Um, you talked about how um, a lot of design is going into how to minimize the zero sum game, and also like using things like bot to increase like player satisfaction. So I'm wondering, like, what are some design uh, iteration or choices that went into like the first time player experience to make sure that um, players have that sort of satisfaction, and how that impact you know like what kind of cards they get when they first play the game and what like if they're going to see any bots etc yeah so i i basically uh for both the hearthstone uh first first time user experience i'm oh, sorry the question was uh, how do we how do we uh make sure that fatui is awesome especially with a zero sum component uh, yeah or so, just like any design related uh yeah. consideration with the fatui so i i uh I, the entire fatui for hearthstone and marvel snap is just copied from george fan's talk uh, that I mentioned. It's just, wor like, we just did exactly, laid it out, and we just copied it. It's like exactly that. If you play through the Hearthstone, the Hearthstone and, and Snap and Plants vs. Zombies, we just, we just stole it all. It's just genius work. So if you're interested in Fatui design, that is the master class of Fatui design right there. I think it's, I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Um, I have a kind of similar question that was asked over there, but as you mentioned, Marble Snap doesn't have keywords, which expanded like the amount of text on the card. So, but when you have keywords, a player has to learn those. So how do you balance the kind of streamlined paraphrasing versus the explicit explanations? Yeah, the question is uh, uh, keywords versus no keywords. How do you balance those two things? Uh, I paraphrased your question. Uh, so <laughs> the, uh, this was a conscious choice. When you, when you have keywords, you are trading complexity uh, for potential depth, right? Because you get more interesting stuff on the card. You can make the card do more interesting things if you can add more words to it. Uh, but if you don't know what the keywords do, then you, you can't understand what the card does. And so for, for Snap, we made the conscious decision. Actually, we, our first designs had no keywords. And eventually, I, I tried to represent on reveal as like present tense and uh, uh, ongoing as like, uh, like just a different tense and people weren't picking up on it. So I was, felt like we were forced to add on reveal and ongoing. Uh, but those keywords are self-descriptive, right? Like there's no way to actually like find out what on reveal means. It's not in the game. It's just, not, it's, it happens when it reveals, right? Uh, so uh, we, we made the decision to, instead of uh, uh, adding more depth by having more keywords, to make every card understandable. Even if you'd never played Marvel Snap before, you could read a card and hopefully get what it's trying to convey. All right. Thank you. Thank you. There's two minutes left, is that what that is? Okay, thank you. Yes. Hi, um, when you were designing the game because it was a studio that was fresh, um, did you get uh, the IP from Marvel that decided I'm going to make a Marvel game or was it I'm going to make a game and it's going to be a card game or it's going to be whatever and then ooh, what if we got the IP and made it Marvel themed? What yeah. was that? So the question is what came first, Marvel or the game mechanics? And the answer is Marvel. Marvel came first. In fact, we were started working on a different game and when we, the Marvel thing started to happen a little bit more, uh, we, we started skinning that game as a Marvel game. And when we, we were doing that, we're like, this is not working. This is not a Marvel game. The things that are awesome about Marvel, which is the uh, awesome hero fighting against an awesome supervillain or a team of heroes facing off a, a supervillain, that's not what this game is about, right? We, and so uh, we took a step back and said, okay, what if we designed a game from scratch to highlight what's awesome about Marvel, which is that experience? And so we made a, a card game where the focus is on that one card type, the heroes and villains of Marvel. And that's kind of, uh, th so Marvel came first. Thank you. Last question, I think. Hey, um, so the modernization in Marvel Snap is really pr player friendly. I was just curious what the overall philosophy for a second dinner is modernization is, like how you guys feel, uh, how do you integrate it into the design, and like what were some of the models you guys threw out? Uh, so the question about modernization, how it's player friendly, and how we, how we do that. You know, uh, 
it, it, was, it was difficult because there's not like a lot of games that have a lot of analog to the way we're doing things, right? A game where you have thousands of cards, you could sell bo booster packs, right, pretty easily. We have like 100, like 200 cards, right? Way less than other card games. Uh, and in games with that few cards, like games like Clash Royale, uh, a lot of these games sell power, right? You could just get higher numbers by spending more money. And because of the way the game works, like the, the, the crunchy numbers we have, like the math gets really hard if you had like, okay, I need to get 623 more power over here and he's got 426 less over here. How do I, it's just, it's really challenging. So there wasn't a lot of analogs for us. And the one, uh, the one that was the biggest inspiration was actually Pokemon Go because it's a collectible game. We really wanted to focus on being a collectible game. And I think that they have a monetization system where you can't, you can't buy Pokemon in that game, right? If you see somebody else with incredible Pokemon, you're like, damn, you play a lot of Pokemon Go. You're never like, damn, you spent a lot of money, dog. Like, it's, it's, just, it's all about the effort you put in. And so trying to uh, come up with a solution that involved uh, being able to speed up your process uh, and, and go up the collection track faster, that was, that was the, basically the only inspiration we had. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm so sorry I didn't get to all your questions. Thank you, everybody.